You sort of drift into it. You, you, it's not a thing you, you set out and say, "Oh, I'm going to be a super criminal and um, I'm going to make my living from this uh, f forevermore." That's not the intention. It, it's all in the short term. You, you really want to get enough money just to go straight and to get into a straight business. But, but it doesn't work out that way, you know. Uh, you, you find yourself um, saying, "Oh, well, that that money's gone. That I've I've invested that, and perhaps not too wisely. I've, I've overspent. I've spent too much money here, and uh, easy come, easy go sort of thing. But it's not easy. It, it, it takes a long time before you you have a real good touch, and uh, a lot of a lot of time, um, a lot of water goes under the bridge before you're really qualified to carry out uh, such sort of." Uh, tasks as a, a really successful uh, robbery. It wasn't out to be the top dog of anything. Police have only recovered two million pounds from this Britain's biggest cash robbery. A robbery carried out, the judge said, by professional criminals whose aim was to live in luxury. I suppose the uh, security express robbery was the sort of highlight of anybody's career, if you call it that, because it was uh, the biggest cash robbery and it still stands as the biggest cash robbery. I suppose I was prepared to do anything at that time, uh, providing I felt I was doing the right thing, if you understand. I, I didn't really, uh, lots of things was I could have done, which I didn't do, because I, morally I, I thought would have been wrong. But other, other things I went along with because I felt it, it was right at the time. They were mad times, they were crazy times, uh, times when life was cheap, you know. Uh, there was um, people getting shot and murdered all the, all the time in those, in those 60s. There was a lot of violence, a lot of vengeance, killings and reprisals and stuff like that. This is where the guy Evans went hung under a lorry here when I drove around the block here to try and get him but he was hanging underneath a lorry and I drove right by him and uh, the people came out of the pub when they heard the shooting the guns going off and they um, turned around and went back in again just here on the right here it was it just here yeah it brings back a few memories so you always return to the scene of the crime, eh? <laughs> Banks post was one at the Elephant. We, we, we had once uh, right at the Elephant Castle there. Midland Bank, I think it was. That was handy, because it was right on the plots. And, um, all, all around and up with New Cross and Peckham and, and there was banks and post offices all over the place and they were good targets, you know, easy targets really because they was, you could get access to the old old banks and the security wasn't like it is today a lot of them wasn't even built and then you had the old black and tan safes and the, and the vaults that were you know, like a bit of butter to get into, you know, in today's standards. They've been there since the year dot and they hadn't changed. But they rapidly, when we started caning them open, they soon changed then. They, they soon started spending some money on some new... Well, it was a, a race against time then, getting to just get down them and get the entry down into a, a bank vault and, and find they've just installed a brand new bank a vault door, you know? And you'd have to pack up and come out again. Everyone um, 
it's got a bit of larceny in them, I suppose. It's not the person walking around uh, one way or the other who would like something for nothing if they could get their hands on it. And um, yeah, from from small petty petty crime, if you call it that. But I, I'm, I was providing things for for people, and I got a buzz out of that because. I mean, when, when I was very young, I'd, I'd walk in and out shops picking up washing machines and and fridge, refrigerators with a, a white coat on and a, and a pencil in the air and a bit of paper delivery notes out of the pocket. And I used to pick them up, you know, off, just squat down to a dead left, pick them up, walk around the corner and sling them in the back of a van. And then... Um, I could sell them at a third of the price to, to I'd orders you wouldn't believe when other people couldn't afford the right, real money for them, but they could afford a third. You know, I've got a buzz out, a kick out of that. One particular one was like the the Battle of Bow, which they they attribute to us because of uh, there was a couple of arrests afterwards, which pointed the finger at us, but they didn't know until that happened. And um, that's when the police opened fire on, or the guards opened fire on the robbers. We never, we wasn't told up, we never had any guns. It was a big, big, strong armoured van that went through London, delivering to all the big power stations, taking their wages. And it was in, had on board about 100 and, 50 grand, 145 grand, I think there was, they'd already made one drop, so that, there was quite a lot of money on it, but on the second drop, and it was uh, all in cricket bags, like they used to carry it across in those big leather cricket bags, all lined up along the floor, and there was uh, two guards f from the, and, and a, uh, a police officer from the city with an Alsatian dog, that was the security on board. And uh, two of the um, guards were armed with uh, revolvers, and uh, which w we was unaware of. And when it came to climbing in the back and getting the money, the most important thing, there was two men there standing over it with revolvers firing away at us, which hit two of, the, two of the firm, shot two of the firm, and we had to lick our wounds and carry them away. One of the one of the firm got arrested for for conspiracy to rob, which was unfortunate. So that put it on the firm. So that I mean that became a, quite a talking point in the underworld. And from then on, but said, how can you pull out now without guns? You know, you, if you're going to go and have a, a big payroll, you're not to know you're walking into a into a, a gunfire and bullets been flying around. So. It sort of started, the, um, there was guns used prior to that, before that, but it made every firm take one with them after that shotgun. Because, for instance, if, we'd, there was a, if we had a shotgun that day, we'd have, we would have got the prize, we would have got the money. You know, if we let a couple go, you know, that, that might have got their heads down and fought twice about shooting us, you know. You don't take it for, for show. You know, if you have to use it, you, you've got to use it. And that that was that at that particular time, yeah, I was quite prepared to use it if 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 the situation uh, required uh, your liberty was at stake and your and your associates were at liberty were at stake, and you know it would make all the difference. You take the consequences, not deliberately to kill anyone, but you know just to just to take the take their legs away from them or something, you know so that you, you could get an escape, but not intentionally, but of course, uh, in, once you pull the trigger, you never know what's going to happen, so, you know, if, but we were prepared to use them. It seemed to change the whole scene, the London scene, and it didn't deter people from going out, it, it just seemed to make them more determined to go out uh, armed as well. It was a turning point, really. But that, that was one of the things, sort of, elevated you or without even talking about it or bragging about it that that uh, elevated the, the firm up a few uh, steps well 
Well, the firm itself is is funny. It's it's sort of word of mouth. Uh, it goes through different circles from, from different different manners. We was all drawn together, not because we'd been school kids together or grown up to that extent. We, 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 it's just the, the names and reputations that have, have been uh, uh, good at what you did. I was no different than anybody else who was working at that time. There's a lot of good people around. And um, it's very democratic. There's no big bosses. You sit down and you discuss something and you, your campaign's laid out and uh, you know everybody's values that are worth and what they're, they're capable of and, and what they're good at. So you nat they naturally assume those roles. Of if he's a good driver, he's a good driver. And if he's athletic and he and he's game, and you get him to do any uh, the physical side of it. And and if it's a technical uh, burning open a, a vault or a safe, the man is a good cutter. I mean, everybody knew their job. They knew what they had to do. Or if it's a bellman uh, to the alarm system. Whoever sits down, they know what they're there for, they know why they're sitting there, and you're discussing a bit of work. It's like a, a campaign, a military campaign with a commander. He, it's not one man's job, it's every, everyone knows what he's capable of, and they, they just assume those roles straight away. There was quite a number of, of, of things that enhanced your uh, reputation. That, um, probably one was... You know, I think it was the mystery of, of, of it all, really, because there was um, things used to hit the headlines in the newspapers, and and they say, "Well, the big touch went off," you know, the, uh, and everyone was looking at everyone else to see, think, because there's so many firms working in London, and um, but unfortunately, a lot of them they used to. They like the glory to go with it, you know. I mean, they, they wouldn't have a, have a, a good bit of work off without letting people know that they they'd had it, or they wanted the, the glory as well. But whereas the people I was with, we didn't. Nobody knew what we had and what we didn't, you know. And we kept it very tight and close to our chest, and um, and we didn't go around flashing money about. Or we we kept a very low profile. Probably what a few things attributed to us that we never had, you know. But um, all the big, big ones, we, we yeah, enough had most of the big ones at the time. It was all surprise element, really, and um, and uh, it was all over in a matter of seconds or a minute at the most, you know. And you, no one was badly hurt, and you was away with the with the reddies, you know. It was all, but. Uh, it was all professionally done, and, and then of course, we, when it comes to uh, doing a, a staying out over the weekend in the bank and cutting through vaults and things like that, then you needed a bit of expertise, which was uh, that's where other people come in to the firm, who was very good at, and capable of doing that, you know. They had a a very driving force behind the two of them, and being twins and brothers, they, they urged each other on and tried to, um, like one would try and do better than the other one. I've done that, you know, I've got this and I've, I've managed to do this. I mean, uh, Ronnie Craig was a stronger personality out of the two, and the more dominant of the two. That You knew they was, they was f for fame and uh, uh, maybe not fortune, but they, they was going to make their mark on the world, you know, from young, you knew that. I mean, I'm in several photographs from the early days, but I was only uh, trying to keep a low profile, even though I was there at these different events and meetings over the years. I was, um, a lot of people didn't really know what, why I was there or what I was up to or what I was doing, but I just, they invited me to lots of openings of, of different Gymnasiums and clubs, and and um, and I was put in different bits of action that they had going, because um, they needed me as an ally, you know, because it would give them a bit more strength to know that uh, 
I was behind the scenes of that, who, would, who could come in like with a sort of um, counter punch or if they got needed any help. And I think I must have helped them to, to get to where they were, you know, by, by being associated with them. When I think of my childhood, when, when we was in Sheepcock Lane in Battersea, and uh, living opposite these stables, you know, where there was horses and and uh, and uh, goats and chickens running around and things like that. Everyone was scraping a living somewhere where the other, and the railway was behind the stables. And uh, they used to get up on the railway and rob the the the, uh, the trucks to, uh, uh, and and sell it on the outside the f front door on a Sunday morning. You know, that was the sort of set set up. It seemed that uh, it was a sort of way of life from a very early age, and um, from there, uh, death and destruction was very common to me, and I just turned it to to crooked small time crookedness, which which develops into bigger things as you get older. And I remember uh, working for the Southern Railway, and. Um, as, as a, a van boy. We used to go get these jobs with a bit of extra money to go to the Mint and to the Bank of England and pick up gold from the railway stations. And I sat in the back with millions and millions of pounds worth of bars of gold and um, with just one tarpaulin sheet with a little leather strap on the back. And uh, I thought, how, how easy would a bit, somebody with a bit of, uh, a bit of guts uh, to, to to have a go at this, you know, could earn fortune, earn millions. I thought then, you know, there's all that wealth and it sort of just wet my appetite, but I'd like to get that one day. And um, sure enough, years later, I managed to do that, you know, get a few bars of gold, half a tonne of gold, actually. <laughs> I learned, I learned through experience with, with the people taught me things. I mean, you learn, it's, it's like so, serving an apprenticeship, uh, going to college or, or university. You, you, you know, you, you get proficient of what you're doing and only uh, after uh, uh, many, many years of experience. And you learn the pitfalls and the, and the, the, wrongs, the, the wrongs and the rights of uh, uh, w what you do in life. And... Uh, I, I found that we was just I was just progressing towards bigger and better things. If it goes off like clockwork, then uh, then that is a successful robbery, and no one's been hurt is an important thing. You know, they may be all roped up. I mean, I I've been on board where there's eight people laid on the floor uh, tied up, but you know, on many occasions that whole night shifts laid down on the floor, but yeah, they have a cigarette in their mouth and a cup of tea and things like that. If we might be there the whole weekend, which in lots of cases was, that's what happened, you know, but no one uh, was a bit traumatised perhaps, but that was about all. Um, so, you know, I don't feel uh, guilty about any of those robbers. The adrenaline is, is like a fighter getting in the ring. Uh, you know, he's in the worst part of it is in the dressing room or getting getting to the stadium or where you're going to fight, and you get the butterflies and and the the nervous tension in, in your stomach, and and then once that bell goes in the ring, everything you forget everything, and that's the same as uh, going to work on on a, on a major robbery. There's nothing better than cutting up a big chunk of money and uh, all going out with a suitcase full of money. I mean, that is beautiful, uh, and it's a lovely feeling. They, they came to, to ask uh, the firm, to, my firm, like to go, go to work on it. So they, they wanted us to go up in, into the carrot, the, the uh, the uh, act, take part in the physical side of it, you know. 
but they, they, they did manage quite well without us. They, it was very successful up to a point. I took them out of this flat that they had in Bermondsey and I put, I put them in a safer house where they was okay. And, and fortunately for them, a few days later they raided the, the block of flats where he was being, where they thought he was. But they didn't, they didn't knock or smash the door down of where he was, but they did it, the one underneath, so they got the, the wrong floor. But it was definitely on, he would have been arrested there and then, you know, a few days later, if I hadn't moved him. And um, and then of course uh, they needed to get passports and to get out of the country, and uh, managed to provide those things for them. And uh, also they Eric had quite a big big nose at the time, Eric Flowers, so it made him more handsome. He got his nose changed to a nice nice old petite nose, and also um, Ronnie was was a good looking man anyway, but uh, it just changed his appearance a bit. And I got him out of the country to Australia. This bit of water here divided South London. It was another world over this side. All the, all the police would never know you. It was in, in, in a different territory. And um, as I say, the East End used to come over to South London and call it Indian territory. Because it's a bit hostile. But uh, I, I stood on them bridges and watched the great train robbers leave and put them on in uh, five o'clock in the morning and stand there, go have a bit of, bit of breakfast and watch them sail off. Buster Edwards went off there on London Bridge and um, and Ronnie Biggs, he left, he went off the same way. And an old, old um, steamer, yeah, yeah, follow it, Brian. And you never know, know if you're going to see them ever again, you know. But of course, they will turn up eventually. I, I eventually went to visit Ronnie uh, Biggs out in Brazil some couple of years ago. And I said to him, Ron, don't, I said, don't think about coming back. I said, because I said, you, you got a 30 year sentence. The judges get past you down. 30 years, you've escaped, which means another two years for escaping. So you're back to square, yep, square one, back to, and uh, you'll be doing 30 years again. I said, and they ain't gonna change the rules. I said, and especially after escaping and mugging, mugging the prison system up. I said, when I went through, ones with myself, went through reception and they showed me a box, the screw in there, and the, and the con working in reception, I said, come, have a look at this, Fred, and they, uh, they pulled out this box where you put all your clothes in when you first go in prison, before you release the clothes, your civvy clothes. And there was his civvy suit and and a mail bag, unfinished mail bag, still laying in the, in the box. And the screw's laughing, he said, you know, this is for Ronnie when he comes back. And that's a, a, you know, it's been a sore in the side of the prison system ever since he escaped. I hoped uh, in the, uh, when Buster was wanted, was a wanted man, Buster Edwards, he was a good friend of mine, Buster, and his wife Joan, they were very close friends of uh, my wife and I, and um, at the time. And of course, uh, when, when uh, he was a wanted man, I, I met some, a year or so later, uh, he was out in uh, Mexico with, with Bruce, and uh, Bruce Reynolds, and uh, he wanted to, uh, to throw himself in, so he contacted me. He threw himself in, in my pub in Lance Street, which is upstairs, 
had a bottle of brandy and a few drinks. And he just walked across the road to uh, the borough police station and sat underneath his poster with his wanted poster and nobody recognised him, you know. He finished up with a 14 years. It's all right if you say it quick, but uh, you haven't got to do it. But uh, it was half the sentence of what the others got. So he was satisfied with that. Buster, you could see the end of it. I think he served eight years out there. And it was very hard those days, very, not like today, you know, to sleep deprivation, you know, and they wake you up every 15 minutes banging on your door and switching your light on. They was experimenting with us, so it was hard, really hard in those times. Never saw the exercises and the, the yard and the, the cages they put you in and eight, eight prisoners for three or four years on you never see another face or another prisoner just eight of you there you know it was hard, hard time I, I think the the initial shock of getting a, a, a prison sentence the first few months of a prison sentence is the worst uh, that is the time to release them and put them out after they've done a couple of months and say, this is what it's all, all about. You want you want to be spend the next five or six years like this. And you felt it badly. You felt and woke up every morning looking up at that, that ceiling. Now I'm still here. You know, it's a bad dream, really. And then you, you say, I've got, I've got how many Christmases I've got? I've got five, six, seven Christmases I'm going to miss out on. And I, I'm not, birthdays, anniversaries, holidays, you're missing all that. And it's it's a lot to get on with, and your mind is from the um, the beginning of a sentence. Your mind is half in prison and half over the wall outside, and it's only after you've been there for eighteen months to two years that you completely f try and switch off from the outside world, and your mind centres on prison life, and it comes easier. As though you was, uh, this is my manner, you know, it's, it's, a bit, it's a bit strong to say that. Same as in the, with the twins over in East End, they didn't run the whole in East End, there were still other firms and other people in different areas. Well, they didn't tread on their toes, they didn't encroach on their, their little area where they was, uh, got their pubs and clubs. You know, it, it wasn't divided up like that, really, you know. If anyone uh, came in your area and they started kicking off there and causing problems and trouble, you'd, you'd find that the the other publicans or the business people would look come to you for a bit of help, you know, for a bit of support. And say, can you have a word with them? And, and I might go around and see someone. Oh, keep out of that pub. Go down somewhere. Go out of the manor, you know, if you want to go upsetting people and causing trouble. Go somewhere else and drink, keep out of there. And that's the, just, you earn that little bit of respect from nuisances and and uh, a few of them who really stepped out of line got, got served up one way or the other, you know. So you, 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 was, you was like a police in that, the area in a way, you know, in that sort of sense. <laughs> We would invest our money in the areas that we was known in, because uh, that's where you had a more sort of pulling power to do its out business. So you you you, you seem to stick to your own little areas, your manners, as you call it, um, uh, because you know if you opened a pub, you'd you'd fill it up with people you knew locally. Behind me now is is the uh, Prince of Wales pub, which I. I I took over back in 1963, just just around the time of the Great Train Robbery, and it was um, it became quite well known. People used to call all the cab drivers used to say, "Well, 
foreman's pub and, and they never even knew the name of the pub really at the time but they used to every cab driver knew it in the area and of course the crazy used to come over every so and they used to make a what they call a to the Indian country, the South London, and they used to come over about 20, 20 or 30 handed and absolutely pack the place out with all the regulars. But it was a talking point at the time, you know. Happy times, happy days there. Until where the spot I'm standing on now, and I was arrested uh, in the crate in the swoop that they made. When uh, just getting in the car there one, one afternoon, and uh, it was on me. They, and that was it. And I didn't see it for another uh, ten, 10 years, this, this pub. Well, I, I had it in partnership with a, a fella called Bernie Coleman, who was, uh, he was a lo local publican as well. He had several pubs in this area, a, a well-respected man. And um, we converted it into a nightclub and uh, a uh, discotheque and a restaurant and also a casino. And this is a casino where George Raft, the uh, Hollywood actor, came over and opened it for for me. The place used to be absolutely chock-a-block, uh, banged out all, every weekend and right, well, through, right through the week. It was very busy and uh, of course it was uh, the first casino in this area so it was very popular. My friends and associates who were with me was always willing to help out and uh, if it got out, you know, it was, it was a bit of fisticuffs and then it became a, a bit of base, baseball bats and at the finish there was a couple of shootings occurred. It was the only, way, the only sort of uh, message they understood. One particular thing was about, well, about 15 or 20 and it came in and with a few girlfriends and, uh, and uh, I was upstairs in the casino and uh, I, someone came up and said, oh, there's trouble downstairs, Fred. So I'll go downstairs. And just as I'm going downstairs, they're, they're, all these people were making their way out. So I let them get out of the club. I said, let them go. So I walk in into the, to the club and see what's happened, what, what they'd actually done. And there's this young girl, I like, couldn't have been 17, I suppose, 18, 17 or 18. And she's laying on the floor and she's been knocked spark out and her jaw's gone, you know. This one of these guys has actually broken her jaw, here on the jaw. They, they went to the boot of their car, opened the boot of the car and got out two pickaxe handles and smacking them in the hand, coming and uh, inviting us to, to have a row with them. And I thought, oh, week after week, you, all you keep doing is, is fighting and, and, and uh, ejecting people and troublemakers and these these were the type of people who, if you have them once, they come back again, yeah, and keep coming back and back. So I, I pulled out the, the little piece and uh, the, the little equaliser, as they called it, and then, and I just uh, give them a couple of little shots, you know, to a pair of them. They both got it, but, um, but only not not to the two of them. Kill them in the you know, or anything like that, just to, to maim them a little bit, you know. One got his ear blown off there, and the other one um, got the little one through the shoulder. But unfortunately, when people do that, they don't realise that uh, there's a ricochet, and it don't go in one side and out the other side. If it's a, a bone, it ricochets around the body, and uh, unfortunately, that's what happened with him, and it went around and come out somewhere else which was very lucky. It's a lesson well learned, you know, to anyone who don't really intend to, to shoot anyone, but uh, accidents can happen. But those were the times then. It was, it was a time when, you know, you, you had to dish out that sort of treatment to people. My father used to fight his his, uh, his brother-in-law on a regular occasion, you know, it was like, who's going to win this week, you know? And uh, I, I witnessed all that, so the violence was inbred in, in you, you know? And, it, and that was the entertainment on a Saturday night, to see two men, you know, bashing a granny out of each other. And you, they'd, I remember even when I was little, they, my brothers used to put me up on a windowsill so I could see better, you know? And they'd just stick me up there to watch it on. 
and uh, the violence was was just part of, of growing up and living. I've got a reputation of being a, have a straightener, which I had many straighteners with, with people, and held, held my own on, on the cobbles, as they say, and uh, and shook hands afterwards, and uh, you know had a drink afterwards, because that's how I was brought up that way. Uh, but uh, there were times when, if if the knives were used and things, and uh, weapons, then of course you, you had to go back with the, the same prepared the same way. I mean, the razor slashing was a, a, a thing that that was p to prevent a man getting a living as a criminal because you you mark his face with a razor, so he can't walk in anywhere because immediately uh, wherever he's intended to, if he's a, a con man or a robber or a thief or as soon as he walks in the door, they see that razor cut on his face. They know he's a criminal. It's like putting a criminal across your forehead. So that was the idea of striping people in those days. George was having a meal with his wife, and he's, he had three kids, three daughters then. And he went to the door, answered the door, and he opened the door, and next thing. Uh, he didn't know anything, he flash and uh, he hit the back of the passage and been shot with a 12 ball sh shotgun and it caught him on the top of the leg in the thigh, aimed at his uh, private parts but it, fortunately they, they was all intact, you know, nothing happened with him. But there was a big hole in his leg, like, something like that. And um, I was unaware of all this, I was unaware of the, any relationship that might have been going on. And uh, I was um, notified that to get to St Thomas's Hospital for George was in hospital. I didn't know what, what had happened or anything until I get, get to the hospital. And when I saw the state he was in, I was talking about amputating his leg and everything, you know. And um, couldn't stop the bleeding and he looked dreadful. And uh, they, they had police at the bedside and one of them sat there, went and had a cigarette, he said, you know, he, he walked, walked out of the, the ward and I could have a little private talk with him and he, and he told me the only one he re recognised who, who knocked on the door was the, the Ginger Marks fella. Well, it had to be uh, uh, avenged, uh, the, what, what had taken place. And I was bragging about it, I was at parties and drinking and sitting on the floor with shotguns and sending the foremans round, but it's only when they realised that, that you know that, that there was more to it. That they realised what they'd done, and uh, they wasn't playing with any um, you know mugs or thing. Those people was going to there was going to be a reprisal, and um, and of course that a month things about a month so later that's when um, um, I managed to catch up with them, and um, he was very lucky because he was. Uh, at, Emma's got escaped that night by using him as a shield and dancing around behind him, uh, Marks, but he was the main one. And uh, he legged it round the street and under the back of a van and uh, drove around to try and get hold of him, the cop for him, but uh, he was hanging under this truck or something and drove past him, circled it, and he'd, he managed to, he ran straight round to the Cray, Cray Twins' house for help and support, which they refused him, because they knew that he'd vowed with me, so they they gave him no help or assistance, and said, you get on with it, you know. And um, from that day on, it's been um, a bit of cat and mouse sort of thing, you know. And of course, it, by um, declaring it all, uh, if anything happened to him, if he gets run over in the street, they'd, they'd probably be knocking at my door and blaming me for it. So, uh, you know, you got these things are best left alone, I think, now. Just around there is where Ginger, Ginger Marks have disappeared. And, um, and uh, the guy Evans was shot, but he had a bulletproof vest on him. So he escaped that night. Unfortunately, yeah, it had to be done. 
you got the whole of, all the London look waiting for it to happen. All the, the underworlders looking and waiting for something to happen. They know it's only a matter of time. Like all things, time. They all get sorted out eventually. If you compare it to politicians, politicians can can do uh, commit so many misdemeanors and and next thing you know they're, they're getting all the publicity of what they've done and what they haven't done and they're back in the government or they've back we've got another post so they're back there but in the criminal fraternity uh, the criminal world if you step out once all you need to do is one make one real mistake and you're never forgiven for that and and that will go down with you till till the day you die that was the, the rules of the game, you know. It was unfortunate that Marks happened to be, he wouldn't have got it all if he hadn't have, uh, been held up as a shield. It wasn't him who was the target, it was the other fellow who was the target. But unfortunately, uh, it's not it's not accidental, he deserved, he deserved, he was party to it, he was an accessory to the fact of trying to kill my brother. The man was um, was a very dangerous man, very dangerous because he'd spent all his life. This is where prison doesn't work, and uh, from an early age, he'd been in, uh, incarcerated all his life practically, and he'd been certified on a couple of occasions, and he escaped, and he got lifed off. I mean, he never actually killed anyone, but he was he was sentenced to a life, and uh, but being the temperament he was. He, he uh, he decided to es escape really. I mean, he had it made down in uh, Dartmoor. He was out of a day, riding the moors on ponies and things like that, and being well looked after. The twins were looking after him, sending girls down there for him to take in the haystacks and money to treat all the locals in the local pub and living off the fat of the land. But they picked him up and um, brought him back to to London and. Of course, when when he was incarcerated in a flat, and it was he was he never had the freedom that he had while he was in prison on the moor. Anyway, that was the, the end result. Was uh, Frank had to be disposed of somewhere down. So I do, I do have regrets, but you know, what future? There was no future for him. Uh, he just spent the rest of his life in the nick till he. And uh, it had probably got worse mentally because of, uh, you know, they get the old liquid kosh out and uh, medications like they did with Ronnie Cray. And you, that, you see people just deteriorate and deteriorate till they're like a cabbage, you know. So there's nothing, they've got no will or uh, physical, uh, they, they just vegetate. So. It, it was uh, it's like someone suffering with a, with a, a, a tragic illness, you know. You, you say, well, I'd rather get it over with and done with rather than suffer all these years. And uh, it seems the only way out, really. As I said before, the, the, the gold brings back was was uh, turned out to be a lucky lucky bit of work but at least the, the, the security express knew what was going after and um, they knew there was a lot of cash there millions and it turned out to be millions yeah and I think that was and nobody was hurt on the robbery and nobody was injured they was all uh, treated fair enough and it was a, a weekend work which caused a lot of and nerves and stress, but all, on all the robberies that I personally took part in, there was the less violence used, the better, and the, the easier you got, you got it, which is always an element of surprise and uh, immobilising the, the people uh, just by getting hold of them and, and putting a bit of rope around them a bit and holding them and getting them in a position where, where they were sort of defenceless. I know that's a bit, a bit of a shock to anybody, but it's better than 
smashing them and knocking them unconscious or, or doing unnecessary violence. And I always felt, you know, the less used, the better. And of course, if, if you ever if happen to fall over and get, get rest, arrested for something like that, you know, the, of course the penalty wouldn't be so bad because you, you've not used unnecessary violence. And um, they're only ordinary workers anyway. They could so much father or brother or husband and uh, why they're only doing a job so why well, it's not necessary that's how I looked at it and, and n nearly all the robberies were, I've ever talked about and some big major robberies and none of them went to hospital nobody went to hospital on one occasion maybe but um, that was unfortunate uh, and the majority of it um, was worked professional like a professional, one of the chaps professionally, he knows there's no value in, in hurting people if he can get the money, sweet. Seven years after the Security Express robbery, an armed convoy arrives at the Old Bailey, bringing Frederick Foreman to trial. Opening the case against Foreman, Michael Worsley QC said he took part in the largest robbery of actual cash there had ever been in English history. Six million pounds taken in banknotes from the Security Express headquarters after staff were tied up. Foreman, the Crown allege, was one of the robbers who got away, taking refuge in a hotel in Spain, from which, at the time, there was no possibility of extradition. With him, it's claimed, went over £300,000. It was, a, it was like living in Hollywood. I mean, it was unreal. I mean, I, I finished up the country club that I was running with in partnership for some of those. And um, we, it was one round of pleasure, really, you know. And of course, I had plenty of money to spend, and and it was uh, barbecues and and club openings and new house uh, warmings and parties every day of the week. And the, and the, the, the nightlife was unbelievable, you know, because you could sleep around the pool the next day. and. It was one round of pleasure, really. Just as well they did bring me back. I mean, I'd been dead by now because I was enjoying myself so much, you know. But there you are, that went with the, with the territory. And um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it the time I spent out there. There were so many people out there from all, all different countries. And apparently, uh, they tell me that the place nosedived, it went down completely because they thought if this can happen to Fred then this can happen to, to any one of us. So there was a, a mass exodus from the Costa del Sol, you know, to uh, other other parts of the world. And um, they, uh, those, I've been back there several times and it's not the same anymore, it seems to have lost that, I mean, a little bit, a bit, bit got in saltiness that there was then it's 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 all clean and tidy and i don't know it's lost it's lost the magic of the place you know i thought that i'd have to uh, delay tech i used delay tactics as much as i could i tried to smash the car up inside the car i tried to I tried to have a round with them at the airport and I got away from them and running around there, like the Keystone cops running around the, the plane and the pilot looking out the plane. I thought, well, he's never going to take off if he sees this going on, which we, we wasn't entitled to, because you know, that's the rules and regulations that uh, anyone who disrupts the the, uh, the airline uh, will have to stay put, won't they, or go to the nearest uh, airport. Um, so I, I was trying to prevent getting, because I knew what was in store. And knowing full well that um, they'd already sentenced to it, a firm to 22 years in prison. I knew that that was what I was looking at, 22 years. So I thought, well, you know, anything goes now. Looking in hindsight, when I look back, it's probably one of the best things that happened in a way. Because I've got it dealt with and done with and it's all past now, it's over with and I can uh, relax and uh, live my life a bit without looking over my shoulder, you know. I 
friend of mine, Patsy Amaro, who's, who was one of the phone, he, he used to say, uh, he'd get on the phone and say, is brown, is brown bread there? You know. And then, then that, that was shortened to uh, brown bread, Fred, it's, to is, is brown there? And it would be brown, you know. No, they've got a name of brown. You know? And then there, uh, and uh, I was like a benevolent uncle to a lot of people. And they say, is Uncle there? Uncle Fred there, you know? And Uncle, and I was an uncle then, and so on and so on. And then, of course, later on, they was calling us um, the eye executioners and things like that, you know, which we never knew about. I didn't know nothing about that. Mothers used to come in uh, on visits, and that you knew them from, from probably from Bermondsey or wherever. And they say, look, keep an eye on my boy, you know, for me, Fred, and on the visits, you know, look, look after him. He was, he was looking after people. The whole objective was when you reached a certain age, you would want to hang your gloves up and retire, and uh, you didn't want any more, you know. You, could, you knew that uh, law of averages, you're going to fall over one day, and you, you want to be young enough to, to be able to do the bird and come out again and have some money to show for it. And, of course... Uh, I mean, uh, I was 37 by the time I, I've got the, uh, the first 10 year sentence. So, and you know, they know that, uh, uh, the uh, judiciary know that that's your dangerous time from, you know, from your, your early teens, 20s and 30s to 40s. If they can lock you away for 10 stretch of that, it slows you right down. and. and and uh, most people anyway, and they get a big sentence that they don't have no more, they say that's enough, and they they swallow it. But um, uh, uh, unfortunately, I was still at it when I was 54 years of age, but you know, that's the way things go. But um, needs must if you look off, you come out of prison and uh, you do a sort of back to square one again. Well, I, I suppose a chap, you could define a chap by saying that um, he's, ex he's an experience at, at what he does. If he's a criminal, he, at, at least he's, uh, he's proficient in what he does. And um, at the, over the years, he's, he's learned to uh, play by the rules, like the sort of under, underworld code. And he's reliable and he's He's honest to his associates and truthful, and he's he's staunch, and uh, he's got nerve, and he's game, and all the good qualities you need in in a soldier, really, you know. But above all, if he if he if he falls, and he gets arrested, on whatever the it may be, you know he's he'll never roll over. He'd rather die rather than to betray his friends and his colleagues, you know. It's such a lot of um, um, headaches and aggravations and, and when you reach a certain age you'd, you'd rather not, you want a bit of a peaceful life now, you need to. But um, I'm not leaving myself open to anyone to take advantage of me because uh, there's still a bit of fire in the belly, they're still there. Yeah, you know, one major rege regret, I missed that fucking Jimmy Evans, I like the cop for him that night, but um, it saved a lot of aggravation. But uh, apart, yeah, you obviously you've got regrets in life, uh, and uh, over all in all, I don't, I don't get any sleepless nights over anything really. It's things I would have done differently. And of course, uh, looking in hindsight, looking back, you, you, I would have, um, I would have done things better, certain things better, and uh, not left myself open to uh, being uh, manipulated, and you know, had a better judgment on certain things, you know. But it's been an uh, 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 enjoyable and painful life, and. Uh, I've not got many regrets, but I, probably people think I should have, but I haven't. And um, 
I feel like if when my time's up, uh, I've, at least I've, I've had an eventful life, if nothing else. section. I hope we see you there.